Tom and I are very happy to welcome you all to the Language Teachers Forum and we're very lucky today to have Ashley Bruce, as you might know as Ashley Cochran. Cochran, yeah. <laughs> um, it's mad at Easter, it's still, I'm still getting used to it as well. <laughs> uh, recently, and, and Carol Berry, who's down the other end of the room. With um, hello, I'd like to um, say thank you for welcoming uh, both Carol and myself here this afternoon. It's really lovely to have an opportunity to speak to um, a group of, of language, people interested in languages and hopefully uh, some of the things that we share with you today will be interesting, um, I, we hope. Um, the nomination that actually Carol prepared for me last year um, was to do with my leadership of the languages department at Clayfield College. I've been there since 2006 and in that time there's been quite significant uh, changes. So uh, the first part of the presentation tonight I thought um, we'd walk through some of those changes with a look at the technology and how that's been shifting and changing the way that we do some of the things at school. Uh, but our interest in technology and how it's used in the classroom is shaping some research that Carol and I are doing at the moment. It's in very much a preliminary stage. We're doing a lot of reading about um, the impact of digital technology and how students learn and what we know about that and maybe what we need to change or what we need to adjust moving into the future. So I'll invite Carol to join me a little bit later and um, we'll actually do that that part of the presentation together and that's informing um, a presentation that we'll do in a couple of weeks at ASA at the Gold Coast. We're very interested in your insights so please if you have a comment or a question that you'd like to make please don't hesitate to stop me and ask um, and we'll also ask you some questions as well because I think your insights are extremely valuable to us as we um, as we look at this this particular topic. Okay so um, this is the first time I've used Microsoft Sway is a presentation format, so I'm trialling this tonight too. So if it doesn't quite work the way I want it to, my apologies, but it's all new. Um, so I'm a teacher of Japanese, also trained as a teacher of social science, but my role at Clayfield is as a Japanese teacher and as a head of the languages department. Um, and Carol joined the languages department in 2015 as our teacher of Spanish. Spanish is a new language at the college um, from 2015, and it is going great guns. She's a marvellous teacher, but the interest is really impressive. Um, I think I've really covered that one now. Okay. So as far as the decision-making uh, that I do in, I guess, running the department is that we're always about the advancement of language education in the school and also just in general. We always want to know what's best for the students and we're looking for opportunities for the languages, to, the languages teachers to develop as well. We're always looking for examples of best practice. I also really love the term next practice in terms of what do we need to think about to future proof ourselves and make sure that our programs remain current. Um, we're also very dedicated to changing that attitude that English alone is enough and that's one that we come up against really frequently, not necessarily with the students, but often with their parents. Um, so we work very hard to make sure that our programs are visible and that the parents see their students engaging with their language and trying to use it as much as they can. So I arrived at Clayfield in 2006. At that time it was very much a primary and a secondary school and I was responsible for languages from year eight to 12. And at that time the languages were Japanese and German. Uh, we also ran programs for Chinese and Korean two afternoons a week and they were for native background speakers of the languages and they were shared campus arrangements. So we had students from St Margaret's, BBC, um, some of the more northern schools as well and they all came to Clayfield two afternoons a week and some of those classes were <coughs> separate, Year 11 or Year 12, and some of them were composite. So a lot of the administrative work that I did when I first arrived related to classes that happened outside of the school day and come verification time when you were preparing all of the paperwork for shared campus, I became really good at that very quickly. Uh, Japanese was only taught in the primary school from year four, but German did not have a presence in the primary school at that time. And I firmly believe that because of the fact that German wasn't represented in the primary school, we found that the German numbers in secondary were very much fluctuating, but if you looked overall, they were on the decline. Um, I noticed straight away that the students were really interested. They were really hard working. We had really de dedicated staff, 
but we were very fragmented in terms of the physical location of our staff. Um, we had, our German teachers both had positions of added responsibility, so they were in a different staff room to where we were, and so we were all really dedicated to the languages that we were teaching, but we really had very few opportunities to get together as a team. So we were operating as little micro sub teams within a larger department. Um, questions I had pretty much right from the get go was how could we bring that team together a little bit more so that rather than selling German or selling Japanese, we were actually selling languages. Uh, what could we learn from each other and what changes did we need to improve retention, retention rates of the students at the college. Okay, so in 2006, there were three of these in the secondary school and we knew them as wombats because they were in little bags that we'd have to book and carry around and we'd have to sit them on the table and that's what they were known as. It was, do you need wombat one, two or three? And um, they were highly prized and very expensive pieces of equipment. Most of our classrooms had a black or a whiteboard and we had an overhead projector. So we were really good at photocopying overhead transparencies. And if we put one in the wrong machine, we'd hide when maintenance had to come and fix it because it might have melted onto something that it shouldn't have. So I think I only did that once. Um, there were computer rooms, actual rooms for computers, and we had to book those. So it's a very different environment to what we're experiencing now. Um, the Japanese, um, the languages department, um, Gail Harris, who's now at Sunfall, she was the head of languages before I was, and she'd been really active in applying for grant money. So we were actually highly envied by other departments in the school because we had 10 desktop computers in our room. And when we weren't using them, you could, there were queues of people who wanted their classes in our, in our rooms because it was a really lovely mixture of desks white blackboards and we also had some computers running down the side so Gail was really innovative in the way that she'd set up the department. In 2007, so I should have said lovely Mrs Carolyn Hoff was the principal when I arrived at Clayfield, um, Mr Brian Savins started in 2007 and he was really supportive also of our languages program. Um, Chinese and Korean stayed after school, they were still really popular. Um, but we shifted the school focus to a prep to year 12 focus at that time. And the lovely Japanese teacher in the primary school came on board as part of our department. And that was a wonderful opportunity for us to share ideas. But we also realised that the primary and the secondary programs, there was quite a bit of overlap as well. So we needed to do a bit of an audit and see if we could make that program a little bit more fluid so that the students weren't getting bored when they got to senior. We also campaigned for a classroom that was solely for the use of our Japanese in the primary school and thankfully it was granted to us and that made a huge difference as far as minimising the disruption to the primary school teachers in that the students came to us, we could have resources on the walls, we could have access to dictionaries and it sounds kind of small now but at the time it was a really big deal for us. 2008 um, was the year of the GFC and we had a wonderful um, Japanese language tour planned, but it was cancelled because all of a sudden the price of a cheeseburger in Japan, I think, jumped to about $9 and we couldn't justify that as being value for money. So that was cancelled. German, unfortunately, in terms of numbers, was still decreasing um, despite lots of efforts in marketing and so on. Um, we had amazing teachers. Some of you may know Mrs. Suzanne Ryan, um, who retired some time ago and um, Miss Birgit Alberstein, they were the German teachers there when I first started. The students who were studying German were absolutely devoted to German and they loved it, but we were finding it increasingly difficult to keep class numbers up. Okay, so major changes happened in 2009 for us and this is where that we saw our first major shift in terms of technology. Our middle school was created and Mrs Vicky Jones led that. And as part of the creation of middle schooling, languages became compulsory um, in year six and seven, but I pushed very, very hard to have an additional year of compulsory language education happen at the school. And that was for a couple of reasons. Our girls were coming to Clayfield in year eight, and it was compulsory in year eight, 
but they were making subject choices halfway through the year. So they were making subject choices when they'd only been doing languages, in some cases, for five or six months and we'd been seeing them only a couple of times a week. So in their eyes, they couldn't do it. That it was too hard, they weren't successful at it, and so they often opted to let it go in grade eight. So by having an additional year of compulsory education, by the time they were making those decisions as to whether or not to continue, they'd done at least 18 months of that language. Things were starting to make sense, they were starting to feel more confident in their ability to put things together, and we noticed very quickly once this decision was made that our retention in 10, 11 and 12 started to increase. So that's something I'm, I'm really pleased about. We also received some funding to implement a Chinese program as part of our college timetable. There was a huge interest in Chinese, but up until that point we could only offer it to native speakers in years 11 and 12 and outside the college timetable, which was a challenge for girls who had extracurricular commitments and so on. Um, lovely Miss Ryan retired and Andrea Kleinschmidt stepped in as our German teacher and we had three languages now offered in middle, middle school. We had Chinese, Japanese and German and that was fantastic but it presented us with some logistical challenges and so we had to work out ways to manage those challenges. Um, so we had the same amount of language time in our timetable but because we wanted them to study two we wanted them to study too so that they had the opportunity to try out something else so that they didn't feel coerced necessarily into studying one language. Um, and they really enjoyed that, but it meant that the time allocation was halved. Um, and some of the students were getting a little bit confused because they were doing this with this teacher and that with that, that teacher and it, it was difficult for them to keep up with what was happening. So that prompted the members of the department to apply to NAUSIT, which is the National Asian Languages and Studies in Schools program, and that was round one. And we applied with a proposal that we would create a program that all languages did together, uh, and that we would have a program running in our middle years that allowed the languages to be taught um, together, and that there would be some commonalities, so that the goal was to try and minimise confusion for the students, but also maximise the collegiality and the sense of belonging as part of a team for the staff. So we were actually granted that in round one, which we were really pleased about. And part of that money was used to buy the first electronic whiteboard in the secondary school, which ended up in my classroom. And again, um, we were highly sought after and we were, we were the technology gurus, which I can't tell you that is so far from the truth, but we were seen that way and we were noticing that the computer use of the students was increasing significantly. So this is a, I'll show you part, won't show you all of it, it goes for about seven minutes. This is a, an assignment that was submitted by one of our Year 10 students in 2009, that's why I've put it here. Uh, our Year 10 students were preparing for senior and in Term 4 we decided to relax some of the content that we were doing and we wanted to give them a project. We wanted to give them an opportunity to pull what they'd done together. So we asked them to create something that was suitable for children, like a story or a presentation of some kind. So we had students, this is Lauren's, Lauren did a Lego mation, which is quite amazing. We also had students who were really interested in anime and graphic design, so they actually designed, illustrated and wrote text for a children's book. We had another girl who wanted to be the new Ellen, so she decided to do a talk show and she did all of that in Japanese as well, but she made sure that the topic, uh, the subject matter was children friendly. And so we had a really wide array of uh, submissions for this particular term of work. Another girl was extremely musical and in her music class, she was learning how to compose songs and uh, compositions. So she actually wrote music and then wrote Japanese lyrics to accompany that music and she submitted that. Um, and again, because the technology use was still limited at that time, unfortunately, I don't have some of those things anymore, but they, they did happen. So anyway, this is, this is Lawrence. <laughs> Do you want me to stop it or? 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 Do you want me to stop it or?
It is. Watashi wa reichi desu. Watashi ga ichiban. Watashi ga osu desu. Fun. Watashi wa tatsuya desu. Watashi wa okiku te kyoroku desu. Watashi ga osu desu. Satobe to wa kikimasen deshita. Demo reichi to tatsuya wa zuto kenka o shitsuke imashita. Mainichi futari no kyodai wa kenka o shimashita. So I'll stop that there. She really was quite amazing. But the, the beauty of that particular task was that we really catered to the student interests. Um, and it also meant that they could use what they had at home. Some of them had technology at home that we didn't have at school. So they were able to utilise some programs and things that otherwise at school we wouldn't have been able to give them access to. And we still do do that unit from time to time. It just depends on the strength of our year 10 cohort um, and whether we feel that they can manage that. The alternative to that unit was like a grammar boot camp unit that we did if we felt that the students needed a bit of an extra kick before they before they got into secondary and, and we they needed some extra um, refining I guess of their basic understanding of language patterns. Okay 2009 um, also saw the introduction of our NALSIP project and we decided to use the Very Hungry Caterpillar, which is around quite a lot now, but at the time it, it wasn't. Um, and it wasn't used the way that we were, we were using it. Um, the application was in 2009 and the program is still going, although we've since revised our decision to do the two languages in that time. And we've gone back to one because the students actually arrive in secondary a year earlier. So, um, it allows us to double the amount of time that we see the students now, which, which is actually working better. The retention rate for senior that I listed in the application, I went back and had a look, um, was 8%, uh, which is very interesting when we look at the retention rate now. Uh, the goal to bring, was to bring the teaching team together, as I said, to create a unit of work that could be used with all languages and to decrease uh, confusion. Uh, we wanted to make the language learning a lot more visible because again we were working against those attitudes that some of the students were bringing from home that English was enough. Um, and we wanted to lift the profile of languages and make it easy for the students to show off what they were doing. Okay. So we decided on the Very Hungry Caterpillar because it used simple language. So these students were beginners. It used simple languages, so we had uh, simple language rather. We had days of the week. We had simple verbs, eat and drink, uh, the foods, and the simple sentence structures. We'd recognised that gest gesture methods rather were effective. So we were hearing that um, aim was fantastic, but at the time it was just in French. So as a school that didn't offer French, aim was not an option for us. Um, at the time, there wasn't anything gesture-based for Chinese, and we'd seen the amazing work, I think it was of Gomura Sensei with ACLAN, and I had been involved in some workshops that she had done there. So I knew that the method were effective, but our problem was if we wanted an overarching program for all of us, there was no single one gesture method that we could all um, use. So we decided to create our own, um, but draw on influence from other things. So we decided to use Australian signed English and that was for a couple of reasons. We had an amazing teacher on staff, Mrs. Linda Kimber, who worked with our learning support. And she had had some experience with Australian Signed English. Um, and it worked really well for us because we were signing individual words rather than signing concepts. So um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with Auslan, but that tends to be more conceptual. So it might be like, I don't know. I don't even know if that's a correct gesture, but I do know that it's are conceptual, whereas Australian Signed English would have a word for I, a word for don't and a word for no. So it was a lot more easy to, for us to manipulate those words across languages. There's also a fantastic, if you're interested, there's a fantastic PDF dictionary for Australian Signed English that you can get um, electronically. I've got a copy of it as well if you would like it, but it's quite fascinating um, to have a look at. Okay, so we used, and this is another, this is part of the website sign.com.au. So you can actually type in phrases that you would like to see, and then it will pop up for you. So I just, for argument's sake, I just typed in, I don't know. Um, and it'll bring up illustrations of how you would sign uh, that phrase. It's got a number of useful phrases for you, like good morning, lots of greetings, um, but other things that you might want to use. And I think this is particularly useful for sort of um, middle schooling years, but certainly also for the really younger 
much the much younger children in the early years as well. Okay, so we agreed on a common word list as a department. I used some of the funding money that we had to buy time because as we know, time is really, really difficult to find and opportunities to get all of our language teachers together was near impossible. So we used some of that funding to employ supply teachers that would then allow us to be released. I think we ended up having two days, maybe three. Uh, and the first step for us was to agree on a common word list. So what words do we need in Japanese, Chinese and German? Um, and they were words like caterpillar, apple, cherry pie, leaf. Um, and we altered the signs based on what we knew about representing tense. So um, present tense and then if it was past tense, we went over the shoulder. It was past, if it was going to be future tense, it was the verb itself and then it was future tense. So we varied it a little bit. Um, the particles for Japanese, we were from the ACTLAN, which I think was based on Japanese sign language and that was um, very handy for us because we needed the particles. Okay, so this is Linda and she's signing in English. Uh, and I won't show you this video because this goes for ages too, but it will give you a bit of an idea. So again, the quality of the video isn't great because this was done eight years ago, which is quite incredible. Um, but it'll show you. So we learnt, as a team, we learnt the signs from the English first. So hapa as in a leaf, and a tamago, an egg. Um, and, oh, we had goodness, there's so many of them. But we all learnt those words. And the beauty of learning those words together meant that when we then separated into our language teams and we looked at the way that that story would be told, obviously the order of those words changed depending on which language that we were using. And when the students were learning two, it became really easy for them to see how the structure of those sentences were different because in one language, the verb might be at the beginning of the sentence or you know, in the middle of the sentence and then in others it was at the end. So it gave a visual aspect to the language that we were doing and it meant we could focus very much on the spoken aspect of the language. So Linda did it front on and then side on so that we could see what they looked like. From, 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 from. Strawberry was an S berry. Yeah. Orange. 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 Cupcake. 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 Cheese. 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 Sausage. Sausage. The students all like that one. They really like doing that one. And they like the lollipop as well. Lollipop. And they love this one. They love watermelon as well. So with the day, because of the days of the week, we um, we used the letter of the, the beginning of the day of the week and then day. So Monday was M day and Tuesday was T day and so on. Mm. But Thursday? Thursday was T, T, H day. Mm. Yeah, it was Thursday. So you can see how that, that was our basis. 
And then we got into our little language teams and we actually looked at the, the story of the Very Hungry Caterpillar. Now the way it's written is quite simplistic in English, but we needed it to be more simplistic for our beginning students. So we simplified it again and we put it into the languages that we were teaching. I need to apologise, I don't have all of the videos. Some of the formats, some of the formats back from 2009 are just not supported by the technology, which is another issue that we're trying to deal with as well. But um, I can show you some of the Japanese one and I don't think Kiki will mind, I hope. Okay. So this is my lovely colleague Kiki Kato and she's uh, in our now demolished staff room. Um, this is the Japanese version that we worked with and we did find that we did simplify it again after we'd done it the first time. I'll stop it there. <laughs> so that gives you a little bit of an idea. What's really interesting though now is our senior students in grade 11 and 12, they still remember it. They still remember doing this. Uh, so we noticed following this that there was starting to be a bit of a retention in senior years and I, we really think that's down to the students believing that they can do what we were asking them to do and they were getting a lot of attention from people for their language study which was lovely too. So mums and dads were really interested. We put on a LOAT, it was called LOAT back then, now it would be languages, but we put on an information like a showcase night and we had the different languages telling different parts of the story and the, the students would get dressed up as butterflies and caterpillars and found a green um, sleeping bag and sort of slid across the floor and they had, a, they had a lovely time. So the other thing that happened in 2010 to 2011 was that we realised that we still had a problem moving students from primary into secondary with their languages and so I argued very strongly that if German any language that we have in the secondary school also needs to have a presence in the primary school because otherwise we're, it's, it's never going um, to be equal, if you like. So in year five that year, our students continued their Japanese from year four, but we started a rotation so that in year four, the students started German. And we've um, stuck with this since um, 2010, where rather than have half the year Japanese, half the year German, we commit a cohort of students to a language and they roll through primary school with that language. And we're finding it's fantastic as far as the level of language that those students are achieving by the time they finish primary school. It does mean that every two, now every three years, we have a bit of a dip in the numbers in secondary for a particular language, but the following year they pick up again. And that's been amazing. And uh, our students feel very confident coming into secondary, which is, which is great too. Okay, 2012 was the year of Google Translate and Online Dictionaries. Um, we had an interesting time in 2012. The Bring Your Own Technology program was started, but it wasn't compulsory. It wasn't compulsory part of the school. But we started to see computers in classrooms a lot more, and the girls had their own. Um, we started with Education Perfect. I don't know how many of you are involved, now known as... Oh, it was known as Language Perfect, now it's known as Education per uh, Perfect. We were one of the first schools that started to participate in that. Uh, and there was a very sudden and dramatic interest because it was capitalising on the competitive instinct of the students and they wanted to get through that vocabulary list. Um, we introduced... Um, sorry, that should say Chinese. There was an interest in Chinese increasing dramatically because of the Middle Years program and the fact that we had the signing happening in Middle Years. Uh, and the interest was increasing. So we actually started Chinese in Year 4. And we had Chinese in Year 4 to Year 10, but Year 11 and 12 was still happening after school, and that was a problem that we had to deal with. Uh, and the reason that was an issue was because for the first time we were having non-native speakers of Chinese in our classes, and they'd get to Grade 10, 
And then the only option for them was then to commit to two afternoons a week and it clashed with dancing or sport or anything else. And they were quite intimidated because it was a class full of native speaking Chinese students. So they weren't, they weren't doing it. Um, but we did have a couple of girls that really persisted and they did very, very well. But we really needed to push for that 11 and 12 to be part of the college timetable. And this started in 2013. Um, so the girls were starting to use online dictionaries a lot more, despite us still having uh, a paper dictionary as part of our book list. They were engaging with, I mean, this is a fantastic dictionary, um, but they, it was starting to be uh, present significantly more than it had been in the past. Um, but this year, uh, Catalina Birch, lovely Catalina, she was part of the first non-native speaking Chinese cohort that went through and she went through after school hours. And in that her year 12 year, she entered the six annual Chinese bridge competition and she won it. So she went over to China with Ruby uh, and she's pretty much been our poster girl for Chinese ever since uh, because a lot of this, the idea is, well, if Catalina can do it, then I can do it too, which is exactly the sort of um, idea that we want. Unfortunately, uh, a decision was made to offer German only to secondary students because there was more and more demand for Chinese and Japanese in the junior school. So that was that part of the year was difficult for me. Okay, 2014, we still use Language Perfect now. Uh, mobile phone use is increasing. We knew the girls all had them in their pockets, but they weren't allowed to have them in class. So one of the tricks was to do a search of the Bluetooth and who was on and um, we'd be able to work out who had phones in class. Ruby was very active in uh, establishing a mentoring program where she buddied native speaking senior students with any non-native speaking students who wanted that additional help and that still goes on now and that happens in Chinese and it also happens in Japanese and Carol's implementing some mentoring with Spanish um, although we've only got our first senior group this year and I don't think we have any background speakers for Spanish, do we Carol? No. Um, so we still do that. So we'll see regularly in the library, we'll see a year 11, year 10, 11 or 12 student helping a year four student with their language, which is really lovely. Um, and these students were mentoring our girls in their Chinese speaking competitions and they were going to the competitions as the cheer squad and they were cheering for their, their mates when they entered those competitions. There was, was a request for a European language to replace German because there was a demand for a European language. And I was charged with making that call. So that was, again, a challenge for me. Uh, and a lot of you may know that Clayfield's quite a small school. So one of the driving factors for that was looking for a language with, that would reach as, as far as, as possible. So I did a lot of research and what I found very interesting, it came down to a romance language. I decided it needed to be a romance language. Um, and when I looked into it, what was very interesting about Spanish in particular was how quickly it was growing. And what was interesting about how quickly it was growing was that it was growing as an online language and a language of industry. But it was also very interesting to look at some statistics that said that native speakers of Asian languages after English we're learning Spanish. And I felt that as a small school, if we could provide our students with opportunities to combine an Asian language with a widely spoken European language in an Asian environment as well as within industry, then really that was the right choice for the school. And so far, <laughs> I have been very much supported by the school and also by um, our students and their families, which is wonderful. Carol was hired straight out of university. She's really embarrassed that I'm talking about this. Uh, but um, Carol was given a huge responsibility because I said to her, I need a Spanish program. I want it implemented in pretty much across the school as much as we can. So Carol started in 26, 2015 with year four, year six, year seven, and year 10. And this is the first year that we go to year 12, but we also go from prep. So Carol this year has 11 classes of Spanish and our Chinese teacher has 12 classes of Chinese um, spanning prep to 12. So as a department with three and a half people or the equivalent of three and a half full-time staff members, we're very busy. How many days do you have in the week at Clayfield? 
not enough, <laughs> not enough. But um, yeah, we're doing we're doing pretty well, but we're busy. Okay, the response to Spanish was fantastic. Um, and in that, in that year, in 2015, we were noticing that I was actually on leave this year. So I hired Carol and then said, see you later, I'm going on leave for 12 months. But it's come, came back. So we noticed that the girls were using physical resources less and less in 2015. They were relying a lot more on the digital um, resources. And the Japanese textbook was offered for the first time as an electronic resource. I can't say I've had a huge amount of success with textbooks as electronic resources because I'd need to be the tech support as well and it doesn't work very well and it's also a bit unreliable if the girls haven't got their devices charged up. It's, it's pretty all over the place but despite giving the girls a choice, what I found was quite interesting is that most of them chose to have a physical textbook despite having that choice. And I actually thought it would be different to that. 2016 was the year of Kahoot. Have you all used Kahoot before? And because mobile phones were allowed in our classrooms at this time, uh, Kahoot was a lot more viable than anything like this had been in the past. And it's always really well received. Um, the girls really like it. I was telling one of my classes today that I was talking about this tonight. And some of the girls said, we love Kahoot, it's fantastic. And then another girl said, Kahoot stresses me out so much. She just said, the the pressure and the tension is just very difficult. I either just check out or I just hit whatever and just the result will be whatever the result will be. So it seems to, it can be a little bit polarizing sometimes too. Okay, last year was unfortunately the very final year of German, but our year nine numbers were strong um, and many of our students decided to switch over to Spanish because we were offering an accelerated beginner course in Spanish. Um, Kahoot quizzes, very popular. But what formed the basis of quite a bit of discussion last year was that we were noticing more and more that the students were reluctant to speak out loud a lot. And as we work in a girls school, um, they were very um, pedantic about their note taking. It was about the most pristine notes and it was all about the stationery and they needed to color code everything. And even if we were preparing for a speaking task, they were writing everything down and seemed very um, reluctant to have a go at, at saying what they wanted to say. And this tied in a lot with our college focus of the year, which was to do with Carol Dweck's work and growth mindset. So we were trying to encourage our girls to sort of reduce the fear factor a little bit. What did we need to do to reduce the fear factor? We looked at classroom desk configuration. You know, was there a way of setting the desks up that might encourage the students to talk to each other a bit more? Uh, could we look at the way we use technology, look at the activities that we were doing in class? So that formed um, quite an amount of discussion. And we asked the girls to, um, to reflect on quite a lot of different things then. Okay, so that takes us to 2017. This is Carol's beautiful year 11 and 12 Spanish class. On Friday last week, we were so busy, we forgot it was the 5th of May. So Carol rocked up to class. They had hats, they had streamers, they had food. They told her that they were having a party and Miss Senorita Berry was invited. Um, and this is a composite year 11 and 12 class. Uh, and they had a really good time, I think, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> so it was great. So where we're at at the moment, our retention across Japanese, Chinese and Spanish is at 43%, which I think when you consider that our NAUSIP application said that retention was at eight, that to be fair was with different languages, different combination, but I'm really proud of the fact that almost half of our year, um, of, of our students do a language. That's something I'm really, really proud of. So what's 43% going into? That's in... Senior? Or? That's senior. That's mm. senior. So we are, we are small, so I use percentages rather than people in classrooms mm. because mm. I think that's a better better indicator. So sorry, is that... Um, mm. When you say going into senior, so is that from year 10 into year 11? That's, our, that's me right? looking at our year... That's our year 12 numbers, isn't it, Carol? That's our year 12. So looking at our... Students in year in Chinese, Spanish, and Japanese in year twelve, mm -hmm. um, we've got forty three 
40% of year 12 are doing a language at the moment. Oh, 43% of the total cohort. Yeah, gotcha. yeah. Um, so we have also started this year, um, languages have been introduced from prep. So one of our challenges this year as, as, as teachers who have been teaching from grade four to grade 12 for a really long time, all of a sudden um, we're finding ourselves in early childhood classrooms and that's a really steep learning curve for us. Um, the students are adorable. I remember Carol saw me after her first year one um, Spanish class and she said, they're like right here. They're right, they're right here. And um, some teachers of, of early childhood, I remember saying, you know, you can wear your stockings in the winter, but they'll, they'll just touch your leg because they're really interested in the way your stockings feel and things like that. So um, it's been a really steep learning curve for us. And it's an area that we need to work on because we're still, um, we're still very much learning. But the interest is there and the parents are really supportive and the students love it. And we can walk through the, the playground now and it'll be Hola Senorita Berry and um, you know, Ohayo Gozaimasu Kato Sensei and so on. So it's, it's a really lovely feel. So Spanish certainly has boosted our numbers in, in seniors. Japanese continues to be strong and Chinese, Chinese numbers fluctuate a little bit. I think we're still grappling with the idea that perhaps Chinese is too hard uh, and we're trying, we're trying to um, minimise that, that idea that it's just not possible for uh, English background speakers to learn Chinese because we know that's not the case. Okay, alrighty. Um, I'll invite Carol to join me in just a minute. So in 2017, we are making lots of observations about our students. So this is sort of driving us into where we go now. Um, we're making lots of observations about the way that our students are engaging with technology. And we know that they enjoy it, but our questions at the moment are around whether technology is as effective as we think it possibly should be, or is it as effective as it could be? Uh, so our focus for professional development this year is exploring the way that we use the technology. We know the potential's there, but we're not sure it's being fully utilised. Uh, and we've got a few questions around the way that we engage with it and are we um, using it in a way that maximises its effectiveness. So some of the questions we're asking are, is the technology driving the way our students learn? So one of the things that we're thinking about too is we have an online management system, like a learning management system. The students are expected to engage with that, to tell them their timetables, their diaries, you know, where they need to be. A lot of homework is posted there as well. We have these great vocabulary programs. And so I think the students feel compelled to use the technology, but we're still also noticing that a lot of students go to their physical palm cards and they like to write stuff out. And um, that's, there's some observations that we've made. The other thing that we're wondering too is it about there's so much software and so many apps out there now that is what they're offering us changing the way that we are teaching languages to students and are we losing in a sense our ability to make those decisions because there are these apps and these programs that can do things for us and they might complement what you do but they might also do things in a way that's quite different to the way that you do. Okay. Oh, sorry, I think I need to go back one. Okay, on it. Sorry. Okay. So this this all started back in 2014 for me. I was on a school camp in the middle of the Sunshine Coast hinterland, where we forced our students to unplug for three days. Drama. Mm -hmm. um, and we had them engage in an outdoor education program for three days. The amount of whining and whinging that we heard at that time about the fact that they were missing their phones, they couldn't get onto their MySpace, they, um, it was incredible. And we even noticed that even when they were wanting to take photographs, they were talking about the best way to position themselves and their angles so that when they put it through their filters and they put it on this and that, they would look really good in their photos. And I was having a conversation with a camp instructor and I was saying, right, you do this for a living. What sort of behavioural changes have you noticed in the students that you could tie back to their increasing engagement with 
social media, just general reliance on computers, that sort of thing. And he said that the, the changes in these have been absolutely incredible. Um, and in talking about exposure to online learning and uh, textbooks and things like that, he, he started talking about a book called Brainfluence, which is this one here. Now, Brainfluence is written by a man who works in a neuromarketing area. So he's very much looking at marketing. So it's how do you market to consumers um, in a way that will get them to buy what you're offering and you're doing it in a way because you know how their brains work. And he was talking about these studies. There was a study done that is part of this book that was looking at the effectiveness of presenting advertising material to potential consumers um, on an iPad, so in a digital format, or in print, in like a newspaper. And then they tested the recall of information. And what they found was that the people who had engaged with that material in print actually had a much higher degree of recall than those who had seen it in a digital format. I found that really interesting because I knew that the students were being sort of pushed more and more to work in a digital space, whether it was uh, digital um, textbooks, online vocabulary learning, um, doing assignments online, submitting them electronically, and some of the questions I was, well, if we know that they are more likely to retain information in print, then why are we forcing them into a digital space when maybe that's not the best way for them to learn? This is how these questions started. Um, and that's, that's what happened. So we had noticed that the students probably weren't feeling um, as in control or the, the recall wasn't as strong as it had been. And there were lots of things that we were, you know, just starting to question how we were doing things. Um, we found this cartoon, which we thought was quite cute. Um, obviously, you might have seen it. Our substitute teacher is an app. And I guess this is, this is what we're trying to avoid, I think. Um, but we, we thought it was, it was quite cute. Okay. So I'll invite Carol. You know, she was hoping I wouldn't, but I will. Our questions around um, the use of technology. I'm just checking that I haven't missed anything. Okay, yes, I have, actually. So I started observing the students more in class. We were watching the students in class. And we noticed that some students have, were really taking to the digital resources. Some of them really were right into it. They love the competitive aspect of it. Um, but others were happy that they existed, but didn't feel overly compelled to engage with it. And we made sure that we didn't assess their engagement with the technology because we didn't want to force them into a style that wasn't really theirs. So we were only ever assessing their knowledge of the language, the way that they made their grammar constructions. How they learnt their language was entirely up to them, but we gave them access to a variety of different strategies. And we continue to do things in that way. Um, students, Carol might back me up, but we're noticing students, they seem a bit less organised now than they used to. This is, and we must acknowledge too that we're talking about our school context, so um, we will be asking you in a minute about whether your observations mirror ours, um, and they might be different depending on the sorts of environments that you're working in. Um, but the students seemed less organised. They were leave, they're leaving things more and more to the last minute, we're noticing now. Uh, and when they do leave things to the last minute, they're offering, offer, sorry, excuse me, they're often going to Google Translate um, or they're going to an online source of a dictionary and they're making really poor choices about their languages. And <laughs> much to their disappointment, they're dazzled when um, we use our magical abilities to say, you didn't write this. And they can't quite work out how we know that. Um, and when that happens, they get kind of upset and, and they, they get put on the spot and I'll say, well, what's that word mean? Oh, oh well, I, I don't really know. Or it's like, okay, in, in an Asian language context, like, oh, you've used some really impressive characters here. So can you read this sentence to me? Oh, uh, no. No, miss, no, I can't. It's like, right, so do you know what that word means? No, not really. Or they'll use a grammar pattern that I know I teach to my students in grade 11 and 12, 
there is no way they can know that grammar pattern unless they've got that from somewhere else, which is often Google Translate, or they'll make um, they'll make errors that way. So that has um, been something we've really noticed. And then we're also hit fairly regularly through the likes of Twitter. I've only recently discovered Twitter, but I find it fantastic for resources or interesting articles or things like that. But there's often things through Twitter that this prestigious school has decided to do away with technology or there's no iPads here or we're um, not doing that here. So there's these sort of conflicting messages that we're trying to grapple with about, well, is technology a good thing or is it something that is... Um, preventing our students from learning the way that we want them to learn. And so there's some of the questions that we're, we're dealing with. So Carol's very kindly um, agreed to come on this little journey with me. I'm not sure if she will be super thankful for that later. But, um, we've been, since January, we've been doing quite a lot of reading around different things. Of, obviously, as language teachers, we're looking at a language environment, but some of the things that we're reading are actually quite transferable to other subject areas. Um, and I think that's, that's what makes this really interesting. Um, we don't pretend to have any concrete answers, but that's part of the journey for us, is that we're trying to find some answers to some of these dilemmas that we have at the moment. Do you want me to throw over to you, Carol? Everybody, this is Carol. Um, Carol's our Spanish teacher, as I said. She teaches Spanish from grade one this year to grade 12. Um, and we have our language rotation in our primary school as well. So uh, next year, our prep students will be starting Spanish and our year one students next year will be continuing the second year of their Chinese studies. So yeah, busy place. Okay, um, so we've been doing a lot of reading around this topic about how technology is influencing, enhancing, challenging everything, um, our approach to teaching and learning. So we're coming at this from a teacher's perspective, but then also looking at it for, from our students' um, needs as learners and looking at the influence of technology all around. And um, some of the biggest themes that come up in the reading are that technology can be a great source of motivation um, in learning. So the stimulation that can be provided through different mediums and the um, easy access and the fact that they're on a device is so appealing to um, the people who are sitting in our classrooms at school and I suppose at university as well. Um, and they can't get enough of it. So if it's available online, the evidence in um, research is suggesting that they are actually likely to be engaging with it. Um, how deeply they're engaging with it, though, seems to be restricted by a heap of little conditions that come up um, as observations in a lot of studies that are done. Um, there was one really interesting um, study that I read which said that actually technology is really motivating, but as soon as there is any kind of challenge associated with the work, just because it's on a digital platform doesn't mean that the students are any more likely to engage with it. So as long as it stays easy, um, they're happy and they'll be motivated to give it a go and be successful, um, assuming the easiness. Um, but yes, as soon as this element of challenge reappears in the work, the digital medium doesn't provide any extra source of motivation for the um, learner. Um, there is a heap that I could say about motivation, but in the interest of time, you'll have to <laughs> deal with me progressing along. I've got a few more dot points yep. there. The um, technology has been acknowledged again in research and reading. Um, to have a great potential for enhancing skill development um, and in our reading specific to languages, language skill development, um, which in turn will increase achievement. But again, some strict little conditions around how this is um, achieved um, exist. And so the actual influence of technology in itself on doing this becomes a big question about, well, if it is so tightly conditioned that these will be my results, how do I achieve that as a teacher wanting my students to be successful and have a language or um, be able to do science and maths and all of your other subjects? 
So um, I suppose the biggest condition, the, the one that's most reoccurring and is described in a number of different ways depending on who's done the research and is doing the writing, is that technology can be motivating and develop skills and increase achievement when it supplements, not replaces, not um, reiterates, but supplements what a teacher does themselves. Um, and the most motivation for use of technology will come when it um, goes next to what a teacher does in the classroom. Definitely not instead of, yes. So um, the idea of blended learning is probably the most popular um, that exists in reading that I have seen relating to the use of technology in education in terms of a approach that does value the teacher input as well as the technology support. Um, Specific to languages, we've got the three acronyms at the top, which I did tell you to put in this order, but I found out today that they're, I'm giving oh, you wrong. <laughs> so um, it, they've evolved. There's been three in re fairly recent time. CALL should be first. So CALL stands for Computer Assisted Language Learning. TEL is Technology Enhanced Language Learning. And MALU is the most recent acronym, probably a came out about the same time as blended learning sort of encapsulated all of it um, as mobile assisted language learning. And the first one I read about was actually TEL and I was like, oh, this is fantastic. This is exactly the point we're trying to make. It's enhanced language learning by technology, which values the teacher, allows us to maintain our autonomy at the front of the classroom, gives the learner their say in how they're going to progress through a task. Um, but the problem with the acronyms and the reason for their relatively fast progression is the rate at which technology develops. And so having technology might just be our little recording devices, but that's not enough to enhance language learning anymore. So we went to computer assisted, but computers are big desktop things and they're not portable. And so they're not useful for anyone anymore because we do everything on the go. And so we've gotten to mobile assisted language uh, yes. What is the link? Yeah, sorry, it's escaped me at the moment. It'll probably be on my pile of paper here. Um, mobile assisted language. Use? I want to say use, but I feel like that's going to undermine what I have to say. <laughs> I'll um, have a look for you in a moment. Um, and yes, so the, the rapid rate of change in the technology field completely removed from education just means that we're completely on our toes all the time trying to keep up with the next best option and trying to find the balance becomes a battle I suppose between making sure we keep it relevant for the students and make it a 21st century course that they're engaged in but still make sure that they're actually doing the learning which is why we're working with them in the first place. And we need to understand the technology as well because you know, we've been raised in a time where this didn't exist, so we're, we're grappling with the way to use it also. You ready for this next one, Carol? Sure. Okay. Oh, no, um, yeah, I'm just, as in we can move on, yeah. Maintain the individual operational stars. I don't, um, oh, we get to my coding point. Oh, yeah. Do you want, I think you can run with that one for a I second. can run with this one, okay. Um, one of the things that we wanted to look at is how teachers and learners as well maintain our individual operating styles, because it's, really important for us to acknowledge that some teachers really embrace technology, they really run with it and it really complements the way that they operate in the classroom. Other teachers are less inclined to do so but they'll have their reasons for that. And we're also noticing that the students, some really run with the tech, some don't necessarily want to do that as well. So we're quite interested in making sure that we give teachers and students the opportunity to make their own decisions about the way that they want to learn. Um, our question is how, how do we help teachers and learners maintain their operational styles and the answer to that is that we don't really know. We're trying to, we're trying to work that out. Um, blended learning as Carol was talking about it as well um, is a potential solution but what effective blending learning looks like remains a bit of a question. Um, we're finding more and more that in the readings that we've been doing it's saying teachers are acknowledging that the tech is there, they need more training, they're not quite sure what to do about it but digital resources are really great when they're effectively used. But that's where it stops. Article after article after article keeps telling us that we need effective technology 
use in a classroom, but nothing tells us what effective technology use looks like. And we're finding there's, a, there's quite a gap there. And what is effective will vary depending on the teacher and the students that they're teaching and the environment that they're teaching in. So one of our big questions is, well, we don't know what effective use looks like. So that's what we would like to explore. Um, but also, how, yeah. sorry, just yeah. apart from just what does it look like? Because I suppose you can all imagine something that you might like to see technology mm. used for or as in your classroom, but then also how do you how? achieve that? Yeah. Because um, I think one of you on this side of the room, sorry, um, has brought up that time and being able to stay on top of the developments um, ourselves to be able to bring that yeah. to our students is such a commodity. It's a real <laughs> so, challenge, yeah. yeah. Um, we were having a conversation the other day about coding and some of you have probably had those conversations that coding is the new language and then we've heard these arguments that coding should be part of a languages department and I think, oh my goodness, I really hope not. Um, and so Carol made this wonderful point that if you need to learn how to code, you probably need to know what it is that you're trying to ask the computer or the program to do. So you need to have a very good understanding of the process. So how do you, how do you know what to ask that program to do if you don't understand what it is that you're asking them to do. So again, it comes down to that knowledge of process that's really important. <laughs> I asked my grade nine class yesterday, and I said, right, you are learning how to code in class. I said, how do you know what you're asking the program or the app to do if you, do, you, know, if you don't understand what it is that you're asking them to do? And they told me that they go to a website and they copy and paste something and stick it in. <laughs> and I think I just broke a bit, actually. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was actually a really predictable response, but it was a, it was a disappointing response, I guess, in that that's, that's what they're doing, because it's mm -hmm. easy. Did you want to add anything? Uh, not that? really. It's no. just that if, as long as you understand, um, you will, um, that a computer won't do anything without a person first telling it what it needs to be doing, mm. then until things like these processes of how to learn and how to develop ideas and progress your learning as a student um, are foundational for our students, then mm. the technology innovation is actually eventually going to stop because there needs to be someone telling the computers how to continue doing things for us, which is almost the issue. Um, for that kind of development to continue in, in society. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. it was quite a ground shattering yeah, yeah, <laughs> comment to hear. I really do appreciate that we're out of time. Um, this article's really interesting. I don't know if any of you have engaged with Professor McWilliams' work. Um, I think she was based at QT. I'm not sure if she still is now. Um, but um, Meddler in the middle is a, is a concept that um, we're looking at a lot in our department. So um, Professor McWilliams talks about the evolution of a role of a teacher from initially the sage on the stage. And then in the 80s, we sort of worked into the guide on the side and we were very much facilitating things, but we were kind of staying out of it and the students were discovering lots of things on their own. And then she comes back, this was written in 2009 about the idea of being a meddler in the middle. And I really like this idea of being a, a meddler in the middle. And just some, some point she said that for a meddler in the middle, digital is optional and it's useful, but engagement and challenge are mandatory. And they are still things that we need to, to think about. Really good paragraph also just about meddler, meddlers creating opportunities. Um, and the point is that they will invariably be users of high-end digital tech, but that they'll be constantly surveying the landscape for ways and means of bringing um, the pleasure and the rigour together, and at times that will mean going digital, but not necessarily always. Uh, and I just love pedagogy matters. It comes down to the way that the way that things are presented and facilitated in class, and how we how we teach our languages and teaching the language, but also teaching the process of learning languages. I think. Um, did you want to add anything there, Carol? Um, not really. M L. Sorry, M-A-L-U stands for Mobile Assisted Language Use. It is use um, for the acronym. Um, yeah, I might let you do this before. Yeah, I just this is, this is our, last, our last point. So um, at the moment, we are very much in a, in a reading phase. We're trying to bring all of this together so that we can come up with a, a plan for action. Um, I'm taking a group of students to Japan in the September holidays. I'm thoroughly looking forward to watching them in Japan 
without Wi-Fi and without any kind of tool and having to engage with native speakers and do really functional things. And I'm going to, um, I'll take lots of notes and I'll just, just watch how they, how they operate there. Um, as far as departmental initiatives go, we are looking at making some decisions around maybe um, the way that technology is used in our classroom. So it might mean that we do have to make some decisions that you know, we, we might restrict the use of online dictionaries um, in the middle years until we're really confident that the students have a really good understanding of how those dictionaries are used. But we're not, we're not quite sure what that's going to look like yet. But we are looking at making some decisions like that that might be challenged. I think it, um, it could be challenged because obviously we do have some pressure to go digital all the time. But I feel it is a responsibility if we've noticed that in going digital, um, we're not getting the results or the engagement or um, the students are losing confidence in their ability to learn and speak languages that we might have to make some decisions about um, what we do. But more importantly, really just review classroom activities and assessment to utilise technology, but to do so in a really purposeful, targeted way so that it is um, very much supplementing the way that we teach our languages to our students rather than just replacing things or um, presenting things that we used to present but just doing it in a different way so you know making making that progression our focus and and determining as we go um, the best way to do that and it will be difficult yes it will be very difficult the but, potential is obviously so huge yeah. because our little laptops that we carry around hold access to the world really mm. but making sure that the students are like I said earlier using it not relying on it and um, yeah engaging with it to extend their own engagement rather than letting it do everything for them um, is probably our goal. That's, That's what we goal. want to see happening, but um, yeah. we're in the process of trying to work out how that might how happen. That's, how that's going to happen, but that's, that's what we would like to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much, Ashley and Carol. You're welcome. Thanks for having us.